Okay. Can everyone hear me? Good morning. I'm very glad that you all managed to find seats. Thank you for making it here early. So, welcome to this morning's panel on emerging technology and social progress. So, we'll be discussing some key challenges in the humanitarian sector and the global financial system and how innovative finance initiatives can offer solutions to some of these problems. I'm Natalie Cargill. I'm the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called Effective Giving. We work with major philanthropists who want to maximize their positive impact on the world. We work closely with researchers from the University of Oxford, and we are currently advising BitMEX co-founder Ben Dilo on his philanthropy. Joining me on the panel today are, here we have Will Ruddick, founder and executive director of the Grassroots Economics Foundation. Grassroots Economics is a non-profit foundation that seeks to empower people in the developing world by giving them more financial autonomy. The organization develops new currencies for marginalized communities, allowing small businesses and local people to trade within the community and build their own economy. Grassroots Economics are currently working on creating a system that lets communities make their own digital currencies and trade with neighboring communities. In the middle here, we have Lucas Geiger. Lucas is the co-founder of Wireline and principal at Open Libra. Open Libra is an alternative network to Facebook's Libra platform. The platform aims to be technically and financially compatible with Libra, but will be permissionless, censorship resistant, and governed by users. Finally, we have Adam Bornstein here on the end. Adam is the global finance and transformation lead at the Danish Red Cross. Adam's role at the Red Cross is to identify and implement new opportunities to improve the efficiency of traditional humanitarian assistance. Adam's team identifies solutions that focus on technical innovation, including blockchain-enabled community currencies, insurance-linked securities, and microfinance. So, thank you very much for being here with us this morning. So, we'll start off by um, each of the panelists introducing themselves and a little bit about why they got involved in this type of work. I'll then divide the rest of the panel into three broad sections. So firstly, we'll focus on what problem are each of you trying to solve? And I'll push you during that section to be as specific as possible about exactly what it is you're hoping to tackle with your work. We'll then move on to how each of the projects that you work on aims to achieve that goal, both in terms of why did you choose this approach over other potential approaches? What challenges do you expect you'll face and do you expect you'll overcome them? And it will be interesting also to talk about what success looks like if, we, if and when we get there. And then for the final section of the panel, we'll be looking ahead to take a, a broader look at where we see this sector going over the coming years and how individuals can be involved. So, um, Will, would you like to start us off with your brief introduction? Thanks. So I was a physicist um, about 20 years ago uh, working at Stanford, and I started doing agent-based modeling and. Uh, um, there was a thing called econophysics, and there was this theoretical model where if you could start tweaking who gets to issue money and what are the rules on that money, you could drastically change these, these models in theory. And it turned out, I, as I found out, there was a movement of, about creating local currencies going back almost 50 years, and there were examples of these all around the world. So I, I got really passionate. I left uh, uh, physics, went into economics, and started studying this stuff. And, uh, that led me to eventually coming to Kenya and starting to work with community groups to get them to come up with their own rules. And I started with pieces of paper. Um, they started really taking off in Kenya, these little voucher systems. And eventually the, the central bank put us all in jail and uh, we ended up um, fighting that in court. And since then we've been just steadily pushing on and just this last year now we've gone into into blockchain, and that has really started to give us some ability to scale. Thank you. Lucas. Yeah, so I've been working in technology probably for 15 years uh, as an entrepreneur. Um, my, uh, recently I was part of Keyscores, which is a data analytics uh, startup that we did uh, analytics for the iOS, Google Play, and Amazon App Store. So we had a familiarity with a lot of fintech technology, and uh, after I exited that company, I started working with uh, a, a lot of experiments on Ethereum, 
because um, that really blew my mind into how you know we could actually have a neutral arbiter of, of agreements, uh, and, and that could be a real powerful tool for us to create a different financial financial system. So I think I'm preaching to the choir here for this audience. Um, and then through some of those experiments, we started thinking about what really a privacy-preserving uh, application and uh, censorship-resistant set of applications would look like. And so I started Wireline with my co-founder, Rich Burden. Um, we've got a wonderful demo here in the last couple of days, so go uh, check that out. Um, but in the process of, at, at Wireline, I was working on um, uh, the economic design at the Wireline network, and we, we were really intrigued by stable coins and, and what that actually means for uh, censorship resistance and permissionless systems and, and who might benefit from these. And as we started hearing about Libra, just in the, in the background, uh, the rumors we heard, um, that, that, that design started to make a lot of sense to me, for, especially for developing nations. Um, so I grew up in, in Brazil where, you know, uh, the U.S. dollar is a type of investment. You know, people can see, if you, look, you go in the newspaper, it's in the investment section. So it's a very important store of value for, for certain uh, you know, sectors of community that can afford it. And so the idea of this um, currency fund, which as, as Facebook Libra is being designed, this basket of currencies, currency fund with instant redemptions that uh, can be transferred to people as if it was cash, is, a, is a quite a compelling idea. Uh, but as we started hearing more about uh, Facebook and how they're planning to launch, then sort of the crypto dystopia started to become uh, clear where this is going to be a cartel of the largest corporations in the world uh, running a, effectively a bank that's too big to fail. Uh, and, and there won't be a government that can bail it out in the, in the extreme case. So um, what does that actually mean for the people that Libra's intended to serve for, the, for, the developing, for people in developing nations? And so we got a group of people from, from crypto together, some of my friends and thought leaders in the space, and started thinking about what would be a strategy that we could either steer Facebook in the right direction, as unlikely as that sounds, or uh, create an alternative platform that's perfectly compatible, a stable coin that would be compatible in the event of Facebook launching their coin, or uh, one that has the same properties and same guarantees. And so we've announced this week a project. It, it really is a meeting ground for people who have concerns about, about Libra uh, to try and influence the, the governance and the direction of this uh, uh, ecosystem. And so we call that Open Libra. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Adam Bornstein, and I work for the Danish Red Cross. I um, work on innovative financing, but as well as looking at transformation. Um, how I got to the Red Cross was through venture capital um, about 20 years in Asia. Also, um, I was an equity analyst for a little while, and um, I worked for the World Bank, USID, um, and a few other organizations. And uh, the, my colleagues and I, within the Red Cross, we look to support the Red Cross as it, as it um, matures and, and migrates and moves and develops into like, a new paradigm, a new world, um, where organizations need to be more proactive as opposed to reactive. Um, so it might surprise you that the Red Cross is not only a nonprofit, but it's also a for-profit, and it's a quasi-government entity. And what's really interesting about that is that the Red Cross, um, in various, society, various countries around the world, there's 191 national societies around the world. Um, we have one million, almost one million full-time staff and 14 million uh, volunteers. It's by far the world's largest organization. Um, under an umbrella. For example, the UN is around 44,000. Um, and our annual budget's around $25 billion. Uh, and so if you can imagine having an organization which is more dynamic and engaging um, and still follows our principles, which is neutrality, impartiality, um, neutrality, that's, that's a really powerful, powerful platform. So we can, we can uplift more than we do uh, even today. And especially as things get more um, more localized, and we try to uh, give agency to vulnerable communities on the ground. And so my role, or my team's role, and, and my colleagues, we look to do a few things. One is risk transfer, transfer risk to private sector capital markets, but also we look to um, become more effective and efficient. And so 
Um, I have a really unique pleasure of being able to work both um, with Lucas on the, the Open Libra, um, as well as with Will on community currencies, and they'll be talking more about that. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll now kick off with the discussion session of section of this panel. If any of you have questions, please feel free to come up to this microphone here, and we'll be very happy to take them. So kicking off, just to get a clearer sense of the problem each of you are trying to solve. Uh, well, I suppose an outsider could say, well, poverty is a very complex problem, um, but fundamentally, perhaps what people in poor countries need is more money. And we can do that as an individual through organizations such as Give Directly. We can send more money to people in the poorest places on earth. We can also do it through things like lobbying for policy reform, et cetera, et cetera. Why is it that the world's poorest people need new currencies or new tokens rather than just access to, to more resources? Why this approach? Right. <coughs> well, sorry. if you had one dollar and it, you could move that dollar at the speed of light, that's all you would need, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have in, in rural areas, in very poor areas, there's lots of goods and services actually on offer. And you get these stagnant markets constantly where the, the current system is just not reaching them. It's not diffusing enough, and, and there's certain mechanics around the money supply that just, even if you do dump money on communities, it ends up within a month outside that community forever. It, it, it doesn't stay and circulate. And so engineering economies and engineering tokens and, and money in a way that causes that money to sink into communities and also gives the communities to leverage their own assets and their own goods and services. So, I mean, the, the general problem here I, can be phrased, the UN phrases it well, they say, well, look, we need 2.5 uh, or 2.6 trillion dollars to, to fill the gap for sustainable development funding. And that's for uh, all sorts of stuff, like food security, for instance. And there's no source of that money anywhere. And, and if they were to pull 2.5 trillion from typical banking interest, then we would just be creating that much debt in the world. And to pay off that debt, we'd be in, a, in, in another uh, situation of just compounded interest. And so this idea that communities are the source, they can be the source of their own credit, they can have social backing and social collateral and fill that credit gap. They can fill the SDG gap as well as this gap of, you know, the World Bank would also say it's about $2.6 trillion of credit that's missing in the world right now. Are there any projects that you think um, that are already operating that come somewhere close to to this kind of system that you're talking about? Which success stories would you hope to emulate yeah. or improve? So, so right now, we're working with about 6,000 uh, small-scale businesses and farmers across Kenya. We've got uh, 12 different uh, tokens that those communities have created, and they've backed it with their own social uh, capacity. Um, and right now, they're doing about you know, $120,000 of transactions just in the last five months about 70,000 transactions. They're using the blockchain, using uh, feature phones with no internet. So we use a, a server sitting there at the telecom. And so uh, the, the blockchain is solving this problem of saying, well, can people, can groups create their own endogenous, their own local money sources? Can they connect them together, create relative prices among them, and also back it up with collateral? And so the, there's some next steps here for us, and that is allowing communities to actually now take those, those community currencies, you know, imagine we create $2.5 trillion of community currency. Well, what, you know, we, if we have a social peg to those and they're all connected with each other, that's one thing. But to have actual collateral in the sense of connecting it to financial markets is sort of the, the, the next stage. And that's you know, what's really exciting to be here with, with Adam and Lucas because uh, in order to, to make those solutions really viable, there has to be some sort of common reserve, some sort of common way for communities to establish relative pricing with each other and, and create that credit supply. Thank you. Um, Lucas, sort of similar question from an outsider for you could be, okay, so there are lots of problems with Libra. They're pretty easy to imagine. But a person could say, well, if you don't like it, don't use it. You won't have to use it. There are existing fiat currencies you can use. There are also existing cryptocurrencies you can use. Why start this extremely ambitious project um, that in many senses you could say the bases have been covered elsewhere? It's a really good question. Um, I think the, there, there's a misunderstanding that if, uh, you know, if Libra launches 
it'll be sufficient for you not to use Libra or, or the Calibra wallet and, and you'll, be, you'll be fine. I think there actually is a pretty significant systemic risk that will emerge from, from Libra launching in the way it's designed um, because if, if this currency goes out, uh, you don't need the currency to go out to the four billion people that Facebook and the association members can, can reach. You just need them to start considering it as a unit of account. So people don't actually have to take possession of the Libra coin, but if they see it on their feed and they start using that as a reference coin to something, um, then we start getting basically everybody who sees that feed to consider it uh, an asset, uh, a store of value. And so how do, we, how do we get that asset and store of value to be part of a greater ecosystem, not just uh, the, the permissioned Facebook Libra chain? Um, so the important message there is that, uh, my, many people don't know this about Facebook's design, but Facebook can't guarantee right now, and the Libra Association can't guarantee that non-custodial wallets are gonna work on the Libra chain. Meaning, the only, the only uh, way to hold uh, a Libra coin is to have basically an entity custody it for you, and that might be subject to, to seizure, forfeiture, for, for, for reasons that the, for the terms of service that the association puts up. That does not give security to the people this is designed for. So you know, if you look at the Libra's claims, and, and I tend to agree that this, this design, of, this coin design is quite useful for people in developing nations, you're not giving them more security that way. And so this is a problem. Um, so the Open Libra organization, you know, we're, we're an umbrella project where we're looking at different ways where we can create either a balance of power with, with Facebook by expanding the ecosystem and, and use cases of it, uh, but also making sure that there are credible alternatives to people who want to use a stable coin that's similar, either pegged to Libra or with the similar characteristics, or use chains that are similar to, in, in operation technically to the Libra chain. Uh, and this is a way that we can possibly steer this in the right direction, give security to people that are end up gonna be using this coin. I'll say one last point, because I think this happened, this, this is a conversation that happens here in Ethereum. Um, I, my personal view is that I don't think it's enough to hope for governments to do something about Libra. I think that that's not a strategy. Uh, the way I see it happening, I think uh, Facebook is going to eventually become regulated as a bank, and their blockchain is basically just gonna be an automation platform on top of a bank. I think that would be quite a bad outcome if, if that was the only ecosystem that this uh, stablecoin was, uh, was a part of. Sorry, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, it's not so much as a question as a, a way of posing the problem otherwise. Uh, it was about, you know, 2.3 trillion, a quantity of money. But I'd like to draw your attention to what I think is the fundamental aberration when we think about money, is that money is debt. And that's a historical aberration, but that's the truth of it. And I think this is what we need to address because we're talking about preserving people's wealth and value. And I agree with you that what people we could call the underserved in financial inclusion, every day they wake up, you know, they, they, they do food on the streets or whatever, they generate wealth. Yeah. But right now, they are captive and they are forced to convert that wealth into debt. And we cannot think about money in this community, which is a topic that we have, without grasping the implication of this aberration that for the first time in the history of mankind, um, on such a scale and with such um, force, it has been imposed without consensus that money is no longer an asset but a, li a liability. Right. And that has profound economic, political, and social implications. And I think that's the point when we're thinking about what blockchain, fintech, la la, about money is freedom for people is the right to own your wealth and your wealth is not debt because a debt is the absence of money is a promise to have money so money is a promise to have money it's irrational it's an aberration and it leads to immorality because once money becomes debt the governing force how do you interest people in holding debt by interest but we know that interest works in the interest of the user and it's a tiny elite and the interesting thing when you put the, the focus of the question like this, going back to Libra and your point, is that there will be another financial crisis, um, the anger of people will be addressed to the banks, but the driving force is usury, and we are seeing already a shift whereby the banks are no longer the vehicle of that active principle, and it is shifting towards the hands of the tech companies, Amazon, Google, 
Facebook, all those guys. And to me, it's not about pointing out the finger to people, but it's that principle, it's on an ethical level. Debt is money, usury governs money, and as such, the people who hold money concentrated and finance, rather than become a, a service to industrious people, right. is becoming an industry of itself, and it's literally concentrating everything to the point that every sector of activity is actually a cartel. And the cartel that rules them all is the cartel that can launder money for the, you know, the, the cartels in Mexico and be called HSBC and do so, factoring in that they will pay, you know, 1.2 billion settlement, which they probably pushed in their risk assessment onto the cartel, and nobody goes to jail and the world keeps on going. Right. And so, so can if I, um, we w just Sorry. say one thing, yeah, just I, before Will and, and Lucas answers that, let's put this in context. That, that was a great question, and I think it's a good lead awesome. into context, which is, when you talk about social progress, there's social progress in like the first developed world, and then there's everybody else, right? And people that are living in vulnerable communities, which you know, 80% of a lot of the workers in the world are living in communities where they're earning pretty much nothing at all and actually have no money to start with. So in order to actually have that debt, and it could be a social debt or it could be a monetary debt, they need to have some kind of commodity or some sort of social currency or some monetary currency to exchange, and they don't even have that. So, so I think that you're talking about a first world problem in some ways. Yeah, I, well, okay, that, that's cool. I mean, but maybe I'll let Will talk in, in Lucas, but I, I think you have to put in that context of where we're thinking about. I mean, it's a good topic because, it, so imagine like we're a group of women and we're coming together and we have goods and services we trade. We're farmers, we're teachers, and we come together and we come in agreement and say, let's create a credit amongst ourselves. There's no, we don't have to start it with any debt involved exactly. And we all airdrop to each other. We all start with, let's say, a thousand of these, these units and we start trading them with each other. So it's sort of like a barter trade, if you will. Um, well, that, that essentially does work, but there's, there's a lot of limitations to it, right? And so when we, st you know, there's a lot of these ideas that, I, you know, even the movement that I'm from is around community currencies has this beautiful idea that, well, money's about trust, right? Like we can, we, if we trust each other, we can create systems to trade or, and share with each other, and we shouldn't really have limitations. Like money is like a, a measurement tool, right? Like, so if, if your builder says, I'm, I ran out of centimeters, well, that doesn't make sense. You can run out of wood, you can run out of inches, but you can't run out of centimeters, right? And so if money is about trust, it's about measuring reciprocity in a community, well, that's, that makes sense. We can create these money supplies based on trust, but now we need systems to trust those trusted parties, right? So this whole idea of uh, you know, mutually suspicious actors coming together and saying, well, we've created a currency over here, we've created one over here, how, how do they reach consensus? What are those protocols that give them the ability to reach consensus. And, and so that's what's really exciting about blockchain is that, well, we can pin those down. We can write those into a contract. We can actually say, okay, we're gonna create a basic layer that every community across Red Cross, you know, that across the world, like post cash transfer programs, for instance, and Adam can talk about that, but how are all these communities gonna freaking agree with each other on how to create their currencies? And, and a big piece of that is the idea of of reserve is still there. There's this still idea of like what collateralizes that? What what is that trust based on? And so there's you know there in some cases you might call it like kind of a bootstrapping problem, but essentially if if the trust is based on this group here, and um, you know this gentleman here's business breaks down, and it was the key element holding that trust together, things can fall apart quite quickly. And so the concept of collateral like on-chain collateral, like, like if I'm holding this piece of paper, and we used to print these paper, like a 20 shilling note, we would print them ourselves, right? They would change hands twice a day. That one 20 shillings was providing 700 meals a year, which is insane to think about. People are not eating because they're missing a piece of paper. Right now, like billions of people are, are not sending their kids to school because they're missing pieces of paper. It's, it's a really weird thing. But if he br backs out of that system, well, what's the risk now? So the, we need to sort of uh, collateralize that risk somehow and come up with agreements. So there's, there's a set of protocols that we're working with. They're, they're based on what are called bonding curves. So the, 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 credit, the credit that we create is elastic around something. You know, it's elastic around uh, tomatoes in terms of a social credit, but it's also elastic around some sort of reserve. And at, as a default right now, we're, we're basically using Kenyan shillings. We're converting that to die right now as a piece of that collateral. Red Cross is involved in 
coming in, seeding some of that in some of these communities, but they can also contribute their own. So this is it's sort of a bootstrapping mechanism. Now, reaching the scale of things, like 2.5 trillion, certainly we don't want that in terms of debt, but there's gotta be some sort of trust and collateral mechanisms to that. And so as we start scaling these things up, we have to think ahead, you know, in the next five years, how do we create those scales within communities and how do we create the trust and the protocols that connect them to each other? Thank you. I'd like to ask each of you um, the same question. I guess just before that, a note on, on trust. This seems to be something that all of you are, are concerned with. And again, an outsider could say, well, there's nothing inherently... A blockchain does not necessarily create trust. You can put lies on the blockchain. You can deceive people using a blockchain. All of the, the problems that beset social institutions or groups of people can happen on or off a blockchain. Um, that's the sort of one of the key problems, I think. And also there's this tension between separating from traditional financial systems, but then having a reserve that's based very much in those systems and very similarly dependent on those systems. Um, that would be one observation that I imagine people unfamiliar with this technology would make. I'd like to ask each of you, um, imagine it's two years down the line and you're no longer working on your current projects, your current projects failed. What were the reasons that you would expect would have been most likely to cause that failure? I, well, I'm, I'm back in jail <laughs> would be the... I'm sorry, that's not funny. <laughs> that, that would be the default answer, but I, you know, so this, for me, that's the biggest thing of like, well, how do we, how do we bring along, how do we integrate, in other words? Like, it, it, you know, the part of this movement that I've been part of is, is just been about, a lot of it's in the past has been about isolation and like creating little pocket economies. So those aren't welcomed so much, you know, and, and especially like we're talking about dealing with refugee crisis right now, and you don't want to put those refugees into bubbles, you want to integrate them. And so the, 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 the work that we've been starting is called community inclusion currencies. So we've been really pushing this idea that, well, um, to fund refugee movements and things like this, we can, we can really create inclusive um, credit supply and money supply that, that could actually bring communities together. So I, that's my biggest worry is how do we integrate with national governments? How do we integrate specifically? I mean, that's kind of the biggest elephant in the room. Um, and there's some, there's potential in that, in that realm in terms of this concept of the space of reserve, the space of trust. And government does hold the space of trust. If we can put that trust on chain, in a way, and make them responsible in holding part of those roles and integrate them into, you know, CDPs or other sort of uh, collateral mechanisms, I, there's, there's some movement there. So you think yeah. the sort of most likely failure point would be that governments wouldn't be willing to adopt new C systems? I, th I feel like what we're doing is inevitable to some degree, but I think they can really slow things down. And, and if we really want to move on things like climate change and produce sustainable funding mechanisms for these things, like we need to sort of make things happen right now, you know, in the next few years. And, you know, like that budget for the, the UN, like it's not just going to materialize. And if we wait another five years and five years, it's just, it's, it's kind of like a running joke. Like, oh, we need this money to solve climate change, but where's the money going to come from? Let's, you know, like it's, you know, I, yeah. I just don't think it's ever going to happen that way. So we need to push in a way as fast as we possibly can. And the technology we, we have, you know, in this, in this room, in this community, is, is already enough to do this stuff. Like, we, we're technically able to do all these things right now. It's just spreading that information, getting organizations like Red Cross to start saying, well, let's just stop dumping money on people. Instead, let's let them create their own, connect them together, and we need uh, systems of reserve that connect to those and bring governments on as well. Um, okay, sorry. thank you. Lucas, why would you fail? Why it didn't work? Well, um, Facebook um, gave, us, <laughs> gave us grief. Um, and possibly the idea of non-governmental coins, generally speaking, uh, gets shut down because of the emergence of uh, central bank crypto, like is going on in China and developments in Europe and you know, speculation the U.S. will do that. Uh, I think that's generally, I think, you know, probably folks in, here in Ethereum probably don't like hearing that, but I think the greatest, the single greatest risk to Ethereum and public blockchains uh, that are, you know, permissionless, censorship resistant, are these uh, government cryptos and large corporate cryptos. Because all of the, let's say, I hate to use the word legitimate, but all the kind of upstanding businesses that are afraid of government that want to use these systems, 
uh, that want to use financial automation and, and you, know, uh, you know, fast settlement medium of exchanges, they're going to go to the large corporate blockchains and they're going to go to the central bank. Uh, cryptos, and, and that's a really big risk for everybody in the in the industry, not just uh, what we're doing. So um, I think that's going to be probably the ultimate thing that that makes a difference. Uh, maybe I'll say a little bit more about that, which is if if all these businesses that have fear of government crackdown um, and are more or less legitimate or registered businesses go to these platforms, it means we're only have, going to have renegade use cases on public blockchains. Uh, and then it makes, e it makes it much easier to go after those. And then, yeah. Adam. Um, I, I worry about relevancy. The, um, the Red Cross obviously is a huge organization. Um, but when we think about cash transfer, and so the Red Cross and the UN together account for almost $5 billion in cash transfer annually, and this is basically us handing cash out to individuals. The effectiveness of this is like 3%. So $3 is for every $100 is kind of reaching where it needs to be and is not impactful. And it's a report that came out a couple days ago, um, and, and, that, and that worries me that um, if the Red Cross can't use technology, and we can't um, engage locally and allow the local communities to be able to own to own these processes. And I think that's the the the, the emphasis and, and the reason why we're working with you know Lucas and and Will is because we want to hand back the authority to the communities. For example, just just real quick, the the idea is that um, if we transfer cash to a community in Zimbabwe and we've been doing this for 50 years, how do we stop that cycle, right? How do we stop doing what we do every single day? And if we don't stop doing that, it's gonna become less relevant over time. And I just wanna show one, one quick slide to, to give you an example. Um, so this is basically funding flow that goes to like middle and low income countries. The, the dark blue line on the bottom is ODA, which is basically you know, development assistance. The humanitarian aspect of that is like 3% when it's all blended in. Everything else there is private equity financing, remittance, foreign direct investment, and the Red Cross and humanitarian organizations don't touch any of that above that dark blue line. And so how do we get into that nexus? How do we start playing in that realm, right? And if we don't, we're losing out, which means we can't provide more money, but even if we do have more money, we have to be more effective and more efficient. And so. To me, that, that really worries me, and I think that's why we're doing these type of things. Thank you. We have about five minutes left. I'd like to invite anyone who has any outstanding questions to come and ask them now. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you so much for the panel. Um, so in the international development uh, theory, there is a pros and cons on distributing and giving away free goods to the emerging economy. Um, the, um, what do you think of actually um, distributing the uh, tokens in a, as a way of the bootstrap to introducing a new technologies as, you know, they're probably, you know, new things for their users? Um, and then what will be the next step if you think uh, introducing um, by airdropping the tokens to the users, um, what's the next step after that? Thank you. Um, Did you guys question? catch well, that all acoustically? I, let me, I'll try. Okay, so if you could summarize the question first. Uh, basically, uh, if you can airdrop tokens to users and th that can be tied into new technologies and using those technologies, like what's the next step for that? Is that basically the question? If I, we could perhaps yeah. tie that into yeah. also any closing remarks you have about how people can become involved in this type of work yeah. and uh, your hopes for the future. Yeah, I, I was really disappointed with Bitcoin when it came out. And, you know, this is coming from a, you know, history of uh, creating currencies. And I thought, well, geez, you know, here's a, a group that's just going to create a currency, air, you know, airdrop a bit of it into the community and expect it to, to, to gain in value. And so I, I'm really excited about getting people to, to come together and say, well, we actually do do something and that can be the collateral, that is the backing. Like, when I create a currency, it is a guarantee against X, right? And, that, and if that X is a new technology that you're issuing, well, that can, that can be a wonderful 
source, but that it really needs to be articulated and, and guaranteed in a way. Like, it, I feel like, you know, the, the backing it with tomatoes, well, those tomatoes can quite often be rotten, and so can the technology, right? And so really thinking about, you know, on-chain collateral in, in a real way that gives people guarantees against, uh, you know, what that is. You know, if I'm holding this token, there should be no question that there is a backer of last resort, and I, and I think, you know, as we talk about creating $2.6 trillion for all these things, it's not like we're just going to airdrop that um, and expect those monies to have value. The communities actually give it value. And the communities have value, right? These women trading their, their goods and services and doing their farm work, that is real value. And, and in fact, that, you know, the whole idea of grassroots economics is about that, and building things from the grassroots up. So I'm really hesitant about these, these schemes that go out and say, drop our UBI token for everyone, and that's somehow valuable. It's like, no, these people, they have their own value already. Let them just liquidate that value. Let them create tokens on it and create collateral systems behind it. So, yeah. Thank you. Lucas? Yeah, echoing what Will said, I think we need to be mindful of what is it that we're trying to accomplish in these, these vulnerable markets in developing nations. Um, these, these places lack, well, these places have markets that are dormant, and if we can find ways to activate those markets, that's the uh, fastest way to growth. And community currencies are one way of doing it, um, and, and there are just other financial products that need to be introduced. And I think us in, in rich uh, countries, we actually have an overabundance of financial products. We have an overabundance of debt, overabundance of insurance. Like um, I think many people don't know this, like your credit card has purchase protection, so next time you drop your phone, have the credit card pay for it. So we have insurance that we don't even know about sometimes. Um, and in developing countries, uh, there's just an absolute lack of that. So how can we start to introduce uh, accessible and cheap um, financial instruments and uh, reactivate markets? I think that's the outcome that we're looking for. Yeah, and, and there's a liquidity issue too um, in terms of like fractional reserve. And you know, how do we take say 10,000 uh, euros and how do we multiply that into maybe 5x? Um, and why would you want to do that? You want to introduce more liquidity. And, and, and in some ways, you're not increasing the monetary supply, you're increasing the liquidity, with the credit supply within that, within that community. Um, and that's really important when you're trying to fill some of these funding gaps that I mentioned up there before. But it's also really interesting, too, when you think about uh, emergency assistance and disaster. So for example, um, some of the stuff that Red Cross looks at is around parametric triggers. And we do catastrophe bonds, which is a basically an insurance-linked security that, fund, that funding is triggered once you hit some kind of, you know, like peril or something, so an eruption of, an, of a volcano. Um, but this is a really interesting system because if you start to get indicators that there's drought, you can then increase the credit supply without actually transferring any money. And if there is like a false positive, and there actually there is no drought, then you can burn off the tokens or, or, or what you have and then bring it back down to some stability. So it's kind of like a central bank-ish strategy. Yeah. yeah, I would just add like the negative feedback is super important too. And so like, if a token is supposed to have some collateral behind it and doesn't, well then you know that token should go away. Like, and there should be systems that allow that to happen in a safe way, where if there was collateral behind it, it can move to other tokens. Thank you very much to all of you. We unfortunately have to draw this panel to a close, but please do drop us all an email if you'd like to know more, because I feel there are still many unresolved and open questions in this area. So thank you very much to our panelists.